Aloha and welcome to a special presentation, the Mayor's Town Hall Meetings. Join us as Mayor Kirk Caldwell and his team present an update on the roads, buses, parks and sewers for the city and county of Honolulu. Good evening and aloha. You know, I really appreciate all of you showing up. This is a big crowd and I appreciate it because I know how hard you guys all work. And you're taking time to come down here to talk about something I believe is very, very important to all of us in the city and county of Honolulu and I believe in the state of Hawaii. I'd encourage all of you who are standing in the back, come sit in the front, please, because the guys in the back are going to get the hard questions. So come on to the front. Some of you I know well, you've represented realtors and real estate and stuff. Come up to the front. This morning, I was out in Waianae signing bills that dealt with um, illegal dumping of waste on the Waianae coast. But when I was out there in this beautiful park, city park, in Waianae Valley, with this most incredible backdrop, I mean, the mountains were stupendous this morning. You know, it was a blue, blue sky, the first clear day I've seen since Anna left us. And it just felt perfect to the point I almost felt emotional and how beautiful it was. But what I felt the most were the people standing around me, which are people from the Waianae community who were the ones who stood up against this illegal dumping, who are coming together to celebrate the signing these bills. But my point is, well, we live, I believe, in the most beautiful place in all the world. And it'd be hard for a lot of people to challenge us on that one. What's incredibly more beautiful are the people who live here, who live in places like Waianae or Waimanalo or Haleiwa or in the urban core. Folks like you sitting in this room looking at me with me looking back at you. The most diverse group of people you'll find anywhere in the world, I believe, living together pretty darn well. And how do we continue to live well in the future? And what is our future going to be? And what kind of community and society are we going to become or what are we becoming or evolving to? And you hear even on a national level the discussion between the greater divide between those who have a lot of money and those who have a lot less. And our country used to have a gigantic middle class with a small, very rich group and a small, not so well off group, and a big middle. And that middle is falling further and further to the bottom. And more and more the wealth is going to those in the top 10%, top 5%. And we see the same thing here in the city and county of Honolulu, only we're at even a greater disadvantage because we live in some of the most expensive places to live in the world where an average price of a home on this island is getting close to $700,000. I don't know how my wife and I, and we do pretty well, could afford to buy a house starting off in life, saving 20% to buy a $700,000 home. And as we save, by the way, that value just keeps going up. We never get the 20% we need. And that is part of this problem. But the other side of it is we make less than many people in other parts of the country. I remember when I came back from working for Dan Inouye and going to law school for three years, I actually made 5,000 less than I did when I worked for Dan Inouye in Washington, D.C. after being more educated. And the, only, the point I'm making is we all know we have our friends on the mainland who are doing the same kind of jobs we are but make much more. So we make less but we pay more. So how do we afford to live here? How do the folks in this room and their children and grandchildren, how can they grow up and continue to live on this land with us so we can see our children and grandchildren grow up in this most incredible place so they don't have to move off to Las Vegas or California or some other part of the United States where housing is more affordable. And what's been happening since statehood hasn't worked in my mind to provide the kind of housing we need and building a long-term inventory of housing that remains affordable from generation to generation. Because so much of what we build today, if it's affordable, 
becomes unaffordable after 10 years, right? You have deed restrictions, shared appreciation after 10 years, it evaporates and that unit now becomes expensive. The other side of it is no one is building rental housing, except for a few instances. I still tell Stanford Carr, he's my hero. He built Kalikwila Place, rental housing, almost 300 units, a 60% MI or less. And he started before the Great Recession and hung in there and he finally built it. So I am in awe when people actually can do that. But the question tonight is what can we do as a community, what can we do as a government, what can we do as private developers to build more housing for all of us? So we remain a true village where we have all kinds of people living together. Not just a lot of rich people and not a bunch of people working for the rich people. And if we continue to develop as we are, I believe this community becomes more of that. And we are not the democracy that I think we all believe in and want to see. And we become a place that's not as healthy and as democratic and fair and we're not living that dream that guys like Governor Burns and Dan Ariyoshi and, uh, I mean, Dan Inouye and, and George Ariyoshi, Najo Yoshinaga, and so many others dreamed that we'd have and did provide for a while. So that's the goal tonight. And we've taken an aggressive stance. Aggressive. But it doesn't mean this is how it shall be. It's a proposal to say, we're beginning the journey. We're climbing this steep mountain. We're climbing Everest. And we need to climb together. And we need to be strong. And we need to climb as a team because if we don't climb as a team, we're not going to get there. So this is about working together. This is not a mandate. This is about a proposal. And we took an aggressive position to see how far we can get to that goal of building more affordable housing units. So, this chart demonstrates, it's so small, it's hard to see. So we build approximately, Harrison, how many units a year? 2,100 units a year. And most of it goes to those who make AMI of 140 or above. That's true market housing. But on this chart, as you can see, most of the demand is at 80% AMI and lower. 80% for a family of four is 76,000. 80%, 50% for a family of four is 47,000. And 30% is 28,000. And the demand is for 10,000 units at 30%, 3,000 at 50%. 4,000 at 80%, and we're building up here at 140 of MI. And if I'm a developer, I'm going to do that. You know why? My margin of profit is better. If I don't time the market right and there's a recession, I don't file bankruptcy. I got a good pad. So I understand why developers do that. I would do that. And we're not saying it's the bad thing either because our marketplace, our economy, our, our, our demand and supply economy is what results in this. But we need, in terms of demand, 24,000 units right now, of which the bulk are down here at 80% and lower. And they're not building to this. We're not building to this. I'm not incentivizing building to this. And this only gets worse. So we have a proposal where we're gonna try to meet that demand over the next 15 years. And some of you may say that's not ambitious enough. We're talking about building every five years about 4,000 units. So in 15 years, if the state joins us and builds another four, we'll get up to the 24,000. And so we need the state's cooperation on this too. So as I said, what's happening now is not working. That chart dem demonstrates that, as does this one here. 
and we need to do something differently. And as I mentioned, we can't do it without the cooperation of everyone, including our developers. And we're going to be looking at state and city land to build units on because what's the highest cost? Land. Then cost of construction materials and labor. But if we provide land, if the city provides land, if the state provides land for developers, and if you talk to guys like Marshall Hung, you'll find out that they say, give us land at a reasonable price or cheap or even free, we can get to you to the goal that you need to be at. So what's new in this strategy? When we started out, when I became mayor, we started talking about affordable housing. But we we're talking about, talking about it around rail stations. For me, the great equalizer is public transportation, mass transit. It's about social equality. It's about providing people a choice not to own a car, which costs about $14,000 a year to own on this island. And take that money instead and plow it back into living, to eating well, to getting the right medical treatment, to put in the housing. So we thought around our rail stations, of which there's 21, that we would incentivize affordable housing. For me, that's the big game changer. One is the transportation equity of people getting out of cars, traveling more efficiently, quicker, with a smaller footprint, not building a four-lane highway one way and four-lane highway the other way, paving more of our land. And having a system that can accommodate a lot more people by just adding more cars in the future instead of building more asphalt and inviting more cars. But the big issue for me is what happens around tra transit stations, a half a mile, a quarter mile and half mile. That's within walking distance. And we said we're going to incentivize affordable housing. We're going to tell developers if you build here, you'll automatically get higher limits. You'll get density bonuses, I mean you can get more units per square foot. You don't have to build parking if you don't want to. Put more units on it. Make more money. We want to incentivize you to build housing that's truly affordable. We are going to provide infrastructure in places like Kapalama and Live Work Play in Aiea. We'll build the sewer capacity. We'll build the water system. We'll build the road. We will incur that cost so you don't. So you can put your money into the affordable housing. We'll forgive real property taxes. Any increase in value, we want to pass it on to you. You save it as long as you build a rental housing unit, 80% of AMI and below. These are the kind of things we're talking about. So we want to use the marketplace as an incentive to get people to respond differently than they have before. And the cool thing about our system is it's going to connect four college campuses, plus it'll be walking distance from the John A. Burns School of Medicine just down the road here. So UH West Oahu, Leeward Community, Honolulu Community, HPU, John A. Burns School of Medicine, and one day, and I hope sooner than later, UH Manoa. So that's why I get excited about the transit stations. So this is kind of the idea, the incentives, but I want to turn it over to Harrison Rue to talk about how exactly we're going to get to the goal we want to get to. Now Harrison is standing up. I didn't know Harrison Rue when we hired him. I was told he was the best. We interviewed him. He was really good in the interviews. But when I went to my first and only U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting last January, mayors from all around the country, from big cities to small towns, came up to me and said, how did you score Harrison Rue? He did projects in our city. He did projects in our town. How did you get him to move all the way from America, from the, United, from the 48 continental United States to Honolulu? And I told him, because we're good, and he knows it. And he knows that he can have a real impact helping us do TOD around rail stations. And so Harrison started working on that. And then when we talked about affordability around rail stations, he said, Kirk, do you think affordable housing is only needed around rail stations, along the rail line in the urban core? What about Y and I? I think they need affordable housing. Why Manalo, Haleiwa? Mililani, Hawaii Kai, and I said, you're right, Harrison. 
Our program can't just be limited to 21 stations. It has to go island-wide. And so we're following his recommendation, following that path. I'd like to turn it over to Harrison to walk us through the rest of the program. Thanks, Harrison Rue. I'm here because he gets stuff done. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, to say just a little bit. You have the information in your handout. Um, one of the changes in the proposal is to slightly change the requirements for developers for affordable housing. Um, right now, if a developer, com developer comes in with a major project, there's a, uh, a what we call a unilateral agreement that requires them to provide a certain amount of affordable housing. Well, within the TOD areas, we're proposing that the city adopt the zoning to make things move faster, to save time and get stuff done as an incentive for developers. So that means we have to have a new approach for uh, requiring affordable housing in those areas. So the proposed requirement is going to uh, cut back a little bit on the amount of affordable housing required, but make it be affordable at a lower income level where the need really is. Uh, incentivize a little bit more for rental, which is where the need really is, and then most importantly, require it to be affordable for much longer. Right now it's 10 years, and then they drop out of affordability. Uh, we're proposing that it be up to 60 years, three generations, could be somewhere between 30 and 60, but it needs to be much lo affordable for much longer than it is. Uh, when, you, when you look at what that looks like, if you keep adding them every year, over five years, you get to 4,000 units, and they stay affordable. After 10 years, it's 8,000. They're staying affordable. After 15 or 20, you're up to 24 or 30,000, and they stay affordable for much longer. So that's a, a key portion of it. Um, some developers, you know, we'll, we'll work out the, the details. We're meeting with a lot of developers, talking about the percentages, making sure this works with their pro formas. But the idea would be that uh, if you're building rental, instead of 30% that's currently required and not too many people are building rental, so we're like essentially getting zilch. Um, we cut that down to 15% rather than 30, but require it at the lower income level of 80% and make it affordable for much longer, even though there's a smaller amount in every project, it'll build up over time and we'll meet that need and keep it affordable for much longer. Um, for uh, for sale units, we're proposing to keep it at the same percentage of 30, but remove the, the highest level of affordability, move it from 140% down to uh, 120%. That's about 115,000 a year for a family of four. So for ownership, that's kind of the high end of affordability. Um, we're also proposing that if developers want to build it offsite instead of in their project, if they're building rental instead of 15%, they should build 20%. So there's a little incentive for keeping it on site rather than off site. And then finally, if, if it just doesn't work to put it into your project, we're proposing to have an in lieu of construction fee that we work out with the industry that is uh, basically a percentage of what it takes to build affordable housing, and that'll go into a fund that can be used to build more affordable housing as well. So that's the guts of, of the proposal for that. As Mayor said, we're also uh, putting together a package of, so it's not just requirements, a package of financial incentives, adopting the codes and zoning, reducing the parking requirements so that money can go towards housing. Um, I'd like to bring Art Chalakam up right now, Deputy Director, to talk about what we think is one of the other silver bullets, is one of the simplest code changes possible, Art. Thank you, Harrison. I'd like to start off by just talking about uh, our present zoning code, the Land Use Ordinance, or LUO. Essentially, it was adopted in 1986, and essentially it was an update of the 1969 CZC, Comprehensive Zoning Code. Um, if you can remember, those of us like myself that uh, are old enough to remember, 1969 um, and prior to that, was essentially for single family zoning, was essentially a subdivision, one house on a lot, um, and that's basically uh, what we had. And you had to have a, basically at least a 5,000 square foot lot, uh, up to 10,000, up to 20,000 square foot in the R20 zoning district. So it essentially is a holdover, our current ordinance is a holdover from 
um, post-World War II subdivisions. And the, the concept of, uh, of a single family subdivision in the suburbs. Um, we have basically transformed uh, greatly since those times, uh, both in population and in uh, um, the types of families, sizes uh, uh, that we have uh, currently today on Oahu. Um, so we have to look at what we're doing with our zoning code. We need to basically transform that zoning code to today's needs. And essentially what we have and have had for many years and uh, a number of uh, planners uh, in the city back then uh, in the 1970s uh, realized that we had a housing problem then and created what's called Ohana zoning, essentially allowing a second unit uh, with a full kitchen on a single family lot uh, if it met certain requirements. Um, and uh, the map here, and you all have uh, the map, shows where these uh, Ohana uh, compliant areas uh, are located on Oahu. Uh, but there's one big uh, shortfall in today's needs for housing uh, with Ohana zoning, and that is that it is limited to family members only. Uh, you cannot rent legally. Under the land use ordinance, you cannot rent to non-family members. And that is why we don't have a whole lot of uh, Ohana zoning uh, interest. Um, what we would like to do in changing the LUO is allow for uh, what we call ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Essentially, it would be like a um, smaller unit uh, where empty nesters, for example, um, can essentially um, build a smaller unit on their property, um, basically move in there and rent out the larger house if they so desire, or vice versa, uh, their choice. One of the things that we see uh, with, Ohana, with uh, the ADUs is that potentially in these areas, we can get up to 22,000 uh, units on there. And the city and the state and the uh, nonprofits do not have to pay a penny to get this done. Uh, essentially, this would be the property owners that would be able to do this on their own and provide that rental housing. Uh, we see this as a real plus for, uh, um, for a rental crisis and, uh, and essentially we're going to uh, basically uh, advocate uh, the ADUs. Uh, now, it's not going to be universally loved by all communities on Oahu, but we have the answers for that, and uh, we think that this will be a great step forward to solving our housing crisis. I'd like to introduce June, June Yang to tell us just a little bit about the uh, approach for uh, very low and low income housing. Thank you. Um, so the, the great part of what we're doing here is our uh, island-wide strategy does include plans for our homeless. Uh, many of you through the town halls have already heard about the Housing First program. It's to help our homeless come back into the communities, into permanent supportive housing. But also what we're looking at is let's tap into our local architects. Let's use their creative energy and look at uh, possible different housing types that we don't see currently here. Micro housing units. We can look at uh, some are fans of container housing. Let's look at uh, single room occupancy, townhomes, and other design ideas. These are all things that we're looking at as not only for just for our homeless population, but also for young, young professionals, people that could use smaller spaces and still get around town through the rail uh, in transit villages areas as well. So thank you, Harrison. So we're gonna open it up to questions, but I just wanted to summarize for you. So what you heard today from us is we have an approach that that um, encompasses three things. Number one, 
We're talking about affordable housing requirements, right? We're going to change that from rental. If you want to build all rental on site, instead of doing 30%, do 15%. That's an incentive for developers, but you've got to go at 80%. And we're looking at 30 to 60 years. Maybe that won't work, and we'll have to look to calibrate it back. But we're going to be aggressive starting from there. If you're going to build off-site, it's back to there's no re you, you do what is required now at 130 percent. I mean, 140 percent at 30 percent. If you want to do market on site, we're requiring that you instead of doing it at 140 percent of AMI, doing it at 120. If you don't want to do either of those guys as a developer, any of those types of options, you can do the deed in lieu. We're at fee in lieu, where you can just say, well, pay a fee. We don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be what it would cost to probably build those types of units. It will go into a fund. We'll work with the private sector to develop more true housing, rental, and maybe market. So it's money we would lend out. We would not build it. The city does not want to get into the housing business. We'd lend it and expand the money that way. Okay, those are the affordable housing requirements. Transitor and development, I talked about that and the incentives we'd put in within our TOD zones. Accessory dwelling units. As Art said, highly controversial, a lot of debate when it went into effect. But if we want to have an Im impact, a real impact in our neighborhoods, that's 22,000 units that could be built. And we'd allow smaller types of units, not big McMansions on a property, maybe six to 800 square feet because it's rental. It has to be affordable. If you're building a 6,000 square foot unit, that's not affordable. That's not affordable rental. We want to see that. And of course, we will be sensitive to things like parking, sewage capacity, garbage pickup, and we're not going to go into this blind, but I can promise you there will be many communities that are going to get upset. And then finally, as you heard from June, talking about housing first. When you ask any of the providers, IHS, all those folks, Waikiki Health Center, Next Step Shelters, they, you ask them, how do we solve homelessness? They say, build affordable housing. And the guys who we see on the streets are the ones who are falling completely out because we can't provide enough housing for everyone else. And I think if we take care of more inventory, we'll have less homelessness. Not eliminated it because there's always going to be this problem with certain folks and we want to work with those people and help them but we move on so what I've thrown out there I know is controversial I know people have strong opinions all over it's a good way to start a discussion and I'm asking you to participate in it so we're going to open up to questions now, unfortunately we only have one mic and the court isn't very long but you guys are welcome to come up here ask a question and we will try to answer it we have many people here in the audience in the, our cabinet who can try to answer those questions. And the ones we don't, we'll get, write it down and get back to you. Or if you have thoughts, ideas, opinions, but I'd really like you not to occupy the microphone and make a speech. It's about dialogue. We're having another one of these town hall meetings. When is the next one? November 6th, where? We didn't, possibly Waianae? Okay, but anyway, so you can come back a second time if you really love it. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to turn it over to Ed Sniffin. Yeah? Ed, do you mind doing this? So Ed Sniffin's with the managing director's office. I see him every day. Very hardworking guy. He's worked a lot on this issue. And we'll kind of let him make sure it all gets stirred up and we've got good discussion going. So I'm going to turn it over to Ed Sniffin. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Very nice to see you all tonight. Um, first, I want to thank you very much for coming out. I know it's very difficult on, on an, an evening to come out to, into the, to a meeting like this. Um, I know the time that you put in is absolutely um, appreciated by Mayor Caldwell and, and our administration. So thank you very much for coming out. Um, wanted to start off, um, you know, tonight we, we gave a presentation on, on this initiative, but we really want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions, your comments. We'll try to answer anything that, you, that we may have. Um, and we also want to hear your opinions uh, on the on the plan itself. As Mayor Caldwell said, it's a living document. It's something that we're trying to get better. Hold on, real quick. Um, just want to also say that uh, we handed out some papers. If you if you'd rather not come up um, to 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 answer ask any questions, please feel free to write it down. And we'll have somebody come and get it from you, and we'll read it up here if you'd like. Okay. With that, please come up.
Hello, um, my name is Wendell Lum. I retired from uh, city uh, 20 years ago. You know, uh, I've seen the rail uh, construction going out to Kapolei, and from that old road, I don't know what the name of the road, but it's uh, about half a mile, mile away from that rail, and I see a lot of land over there, and that's all state agricultural land. I think the state land use um, agricultural boundaries should be reviewed by city, I, I gotta say city, not the state, yeah. Because I don't like to see what's going on with uh, Kaka'ako and these high rises and these condos are so expensive. I can tell you that for me, when I graduated from high school, I bought a lot about three years after I graduated and the price was under $10,000. And the homes were, there were two other lots, 15,000 and 12,000, I bought the 9,500 lot. So <coughs> today, you can't buy a single lot, I guess quarter million dollars I think it's gonna be. But I think, uh, I think there is this agricultural land that can be converted to um, urban use, but there has to be a review and make everybody happy. I know there are a lot of people opposed to what's going on. But another thing, I see Hawaiian Electric is taking away a lot of our agricultural lands. It's in the news, but they don't tell you that it's state agricultural land use land that they're taking away. And like, uh, I think it was yesterday's paper, they're taking up another 1,400 acres, like, I think, but that's Kamehameha School property. And um, also at the, at the senator, oh, what's her name, uh, out in Mililani, that's, uh, I forgot how many acres they're taking away, about 150 or more acres. And uh, some other um, sites that Hawaiian Electric want to put these wind farms, which they take so much land away, and that it could be uh, converted to um, urban use, I think. And I know the mayor is talking about smaller lots and things like that. But uh, yeah, I guess if the R5 zoning, that's adequate enough, I think, 5,000 square feet. But it's, it's my thought, and uh, I think uh, the state land use um, boundaries has to be changed and so that more homes can be accommodated. And I know there's some people opposed to that, but it has to be done so prices and people can live um, you know, in a home of their own and not in a rental so much or in a condo, which even worse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, you have a call? Please. Hi, Ed. I'm Dr. Smart. Go on. Good to meet you. I finally met you. Good to meet you. This is my architect, Jim Schmidt, and we've been looking around <coughs> town for the last two and a half years. Right. And there's, <coughs> there's a huge number of homes that were built in Waihua, Waipahu, that are single family, one story, that could be jacked up nine feet and provide a complete living unit underneath. If this was done, the people that are currently retired or what have you that are living in their home, they in fact become developers and they can accrue all the benefits of being individual developers because now they have an apartment below their home either for their children or their grandchildren and things can be done very efficiently. Most of these homes were built in the 50s and 60s and they're not carrying a huge mortgage. So the financing for this is very, very simple. The design and construction has been going on in Hawaii for years. There's companies that will jack them up and build underneath. Uh, we happen to be using uh, shipping containers 40 feet, 45 feet. They're extremely structurally strong. They're safe. They take the house out of the termite zone. They're fireproof, and there's a whole lot of other advantages to it. So anyway, <clears throat> That's just one thing right now that would take about 20% of the current housing inventory and jack it up and make it available to everyone else that needs inventory. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much, Don. Does anybody else have a, have a comment or question? Stand Please. Right oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm Barbara Allison Simpson. I came here in July of 1964, got married to a submarine sailor at Pearl Harbor. He is now buried at Punch Bowl. He spent 15 of his 20 years here in Hawaii. I have two kids, 
My oldest one, I adopted when he was, when I was five and a half months pregnant. He's Hawaiian, Tahitian, Chinese, African American. And my son and my husband lived in Nanakuli for 10 years. So I'm not just kind of flying in saying, I know something. I know that there are some military folks, veterans, who are homeless. They're not going to be in any place that you want them to be. What I learned, because I'm at Schofield right now in the largest cul-de-sac, and I heard you say no parking. I learned that you can become a family if you are part of a cul-de-sac. I actually measured it. It's 150 uh, inches in diameter. It provides parking. Kids learn to ride their bikes. Um, families help each other. I'm saying that because we even had a Korean wife try to kill herself, and the whole neighborhood took over and helped the kids. My granddaughter watched her children. I'm saying there is some other ways that's like a village. I see some of the models have lots of houses, but people don't get a chance to interact with each other. And the cul-de-sac allows that. It allows playground space for the kids to play. It allows for opportunities for people to get to know each other. And I want to do a Veterans Ohana Village using shipping containers to make one and two bedroom apartments, two, three, and four bedroom townhouses, three and four bedroom single family homes. I believe that Habitat for Humanity, humanity can make a difference. I've already talked to CBs at Pearl Harbor who are willing to work because they know how to do that. Because when they ship stuff overseas to Iraq and Afghanistan, they take those same shipping containers and make housing out of it. I think there's a different way to look at it so that people can add to it by volunteering their time. We have an Army Corps of Engineers. They know how to do this, too. I think there's another way to look at it. So I'm available. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. My name is John Knox, and I have a question probably for Harrison. Uh, real fast, though, yay for a lot of this, maybe, maybe even all of it and particularly yay for the sort of uh, willingness to put something out there and, and talk about it. Um, one aspect that I've heard some uh, theoretical concerns about is extending that uh, length of time that for sale, purchased homes remain affordable, concern that you might be creating a two-tier economy, that uh, there might not be as much motivation to keep up the uh, houses, etc. And I'm just curious about that. What sort of track, historical track record, if any, uh, are we aware of uh, from places that actually have had uh, housing kept affordable for 30 to 60 years? Do we, do we have any evidence about what happens on those concerns? Uh, th thanks for the question, John. Um, folks, you can do just a, a little bit of homework yourself in, in, in terms of not having to have me give you all the information. If you do pull down the strategy itself, downloaded on the back of your handout, there's a, a web address to download the whole strategy. And in there, we have examples of 18 places around the country, other cities that have adopted similar, uh, similar uh, strategies. And, and so we've done a little homework. You can look at those yourself. Um, in terms of the longevity, most of those places, and, and they've been doing it for anywhere from the last five to 15 or 20 years, so there's a little bit of track record with it. Most of those uh, peg at somewhere between 25 to 30 to 50 or 60 years. So there's a range in, in all of them. Um, they've had some good track record. Right now, we're exploring uh, different ways to uh, do a much simpler job of, of maintaining affordability. Right now, we have this pretty complex buyback and income qualification, and we're a little concerned with for sale. What about the second guy to sell to the, to the third buyer? It's got to be pretty simple. You shouldn't have to walk down and prove your buyer's income at City Hall, things like that. So um, one of the potential things would be to actually just use a proportional ratio. You know, If you bought it for 20% less when you sell it, you just get an appraisal and have to sell it to somebody for 20% less. We're not sure that we're recommending that. We're looking at three or four different schemes. But we're looking for the simplest, easiest, most fair to everybody way to try and maintain that long-term affordability. 
Um, you know, that's the question you asked is the one that we get asked the most. You know, the American dream is you buy a house, it appreciates, you become part of the middle class. Um, but fewer and fewer people are able to buy that first house, become part of the middle class. So we're trying to keep the affordable affordability there. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be an increase in value and be shared appreciation, but someone would be left on the table for the next person instead of all for that one person. And then they're okay, but there's so many others behind that never catch up. But that's where we want to work with the with people, the bankers, the lenders, the financiers. We've been told to, I, we are meeting with developers. I have coffee hours with tomorrow morning. I'm meeting with a group again. And one thing I've learned, they say for these affordable housing tax credits, they only go for 30 years. It says, and they're fixed interest at that rate, and so they can find that, they know what the fixed, what, what the expend rate is gonna be. But after that, you don't know. So they're saying on rental, you may just have to lock it in for 30 years. Now, that's something we need to look at. The reason I stood up really, though, too, is the next guy, if it's okay, Ed, I'm gonna call on this man right here. Um, this man standing to my left and your right is, is Tom Donnell. He's a professor at University of Hawaii in planning. Um, he is here, I think, because he cares about affordable housing, but this man is also helping us on our age-friendly cities initiative. We've agreed, we've, we've linked up with the World Health Organization to make ourselves one of our one of the age-friendly cities in the country and in the world. That means for all of us, by the way. It means for little Keiki, to our seniors, right now you try to cross Kapiolani Boulevard or King Street, you gotta be a healthy middle-aged American. You gotta sprint across before the light starts running, don't walk. We're gonna rebuild how we do this through complete streets and other ways. And this man here is helping us. He's retired, he could just sit at home, look out over the ocean. He lives on Wilhelmina Rise, Monolani Heights, and cruise, but he's not. He's helping us and he's here tonight too. I'm glad to see you here, you love, you care about affordable housing. So. Come on up, I just wanted to introduce him because he's a great guy, okay. And a father of six kids, or eight kids? Eight kids, father of eight. That's why he has so much white hair. I'm gonna have to take Kirk around with me to introduce me where I, wherever I go. <laughs> My pitch tonight is to what Art was speaking about on Ohana Housing, which is now called Accessory Dwelling, since we'll eliminate the family requirement. It seems to me, Art, that it's possible to move on this relatively rapidly. It's a matter of revising the ordinance which governs Ohana Housing, and there are drafts available Appleseed and I and others have been working on this and some of your own people. And it seems to me that you ought to put that at the head of the parade because it can be moved relatively rapidly. Um, it's accessory dwelling, by the way, is not only applicable in single families, it's also applicable in high-rise. We could be using this to the benefit of affordable housing in Kaka'ako. It's also um, applicable to new housing, new single family or dupl duplexes. So we need to move. And Art, my real question for you, there's some impediments in the way, by the way. It cost about Ten or twelve thousand dollars up front of city charges to move into a new Ohana, um, and I think that needs to be looked at. But Art, I'm asking you, how fast can we move? Thank you, Tom. Um, just uh, so that you all know, um, I'm a planner by profession, and essentially. I would not be here tonight if it wasn't for, for Tom. Uh, he basically was my inspiration in uh, uh, going to the uh, UH uh, uh, planning program. And so thank you, Tom. Uh, I see you're still uh, giving me those uh, uh, exams and quizzes. <laughs> but uh, the answer uh, is Tom is exactly right. Uh, basically, we don't have to wait to implement the entire housing policy um, 
to uh, um, initiate uh, the ADUs uh, in our change in the ordinance. Like I said, it's in, um, we have Ohana in our current uh, LUO uh, land use ordinance. So basically it's a matter of just amending that section of the LUO to allow um, um, the ADUs. Uh, it could be as simple as changing um, family member to um, non family members. Um, it's that simple a change. Obviously there's a lot more to it than that. Um, as, uh, as I pointed out before, um, there's some uh, questions that uh, the communities will have, um, concerns that uh, we will be addressing. Um, but, uh, but Tom's exactly right and we are moving forward um, to make that our first uh, um, uh, change uh, an initiative in our housing policy to take before the city council to uh, change our ordinance. Hi, I'm Jim Schmidt, I'm an architect, and this is sort of sounding like old home week here to me. Uh, I went to UH, so I have the same feelings. But um, and I also think that ADU is exactly where to go. Now, I've been doing this in Honolulu for over 40 years, and I've done 650 single-family homes, a few Ohanas, and a lot of ADUs, even though, in fact, they're not legal. Um, I happen to know when my clients, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that Art knows. Art and I have talked quite seriously quite a while. Um, but uh, what happens is you design a room that can be rented out. And you're not going to have the problems with ADUs that you think you are. Every community has them right now. Every community, if it was allowed, it could be done. Now, I personally think, because I'm, I'm more interested right now on the low end of the spectrum than I am on the high end of the spectrum, that you're going to have a couple of people in the very rich neighborhoods that are objecting to the idea. Uh, but, you know, behind their back, they'll have one themselves. And... And the bulk of people, the bulk of the people uh, who live in what we in Hawaii call a middle class neighborhood, they really, really need that to make their mortgage and to make their lives uh, more affordable themselves. And, and I'm not saying that the low end of the spectrum doesn't need it more, they do. But I think that what you have to do is just like you were talking about um, with the escalation on resale of a 20% less than, than what you're getting, you have to have that factor in it also. You don't want to just say, we want the middle class to be a higher up middle class. But you have to say that we want you guys who have the ability to create these housings to rent them at less than the going rate now. There's going to be competition among more people. I, I think you have to have some factor in there that makes it affordable. Otherwise, you're just going to have the middle class are going to become upper class and the upper class are going to make more money and the lower class are going to still have nowhere to go because I know how it is, and nobody's going to rent these things out for less than they can get for them, unless there's some incentive to do that. So that's, that's my thoughts on the ADU. Uh, and I, I've been preaching this for a long time, and I, I'm delighted that you guys are on that ball game, and I, I really like that. Now I have one question for Harrison, and that is on your TODs, where we've already established that the land is the highest cost in housing, maybe not in high-rises, but in housing in general, the land is the high cost. Now, when you've given incentives in the, in the neighborhoods of the transit stations that are going to make it more affordable for developers, if I'm a landowner in that neighborhood, my price of my land just went up because I know now that there's going to be a lot more demand for my land. Um, is there any potential for, without becoming a communist country, of uh, limiting that? Thank you very much. Now I feel like I'm back in planning school. That's a, that's a, a, a tough question. Um, it, it does not seem very easy to actually put caps on land you know, in our market economy. Um, what we're proposing is that the city adopt a, a certain portion of the zoning. In other words, you're up to, up to a certain height, maybe half of what would be the, the max. Uh, and then in return for getting the extra height and density, that you have to build more affordable housing, you know, as part of that negotiation for the additional 
height and density. So if you're coming in and, you know, say in, in the downtown or Ala Moana neighborhood, the max might be 400 feet, and you might be allowed to build up to 200 or 250 feet in return for the additional height, you'd have to build more affordable housing. That's our, our best assumption right now to get that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Where are you going to have these details built? For this plan itself? Well, we, we didn't want to inundate you tonight, but the, uh, the strategy itself is uh, about 20 pages long with about a 10-page ap appendix that's online. So the details of what we're proposing are in that. As we're uh, wor talking with people over the next couple of months, we'll be refining that. There's about a six or eight-page action plan that summarizes all the stuff that we've talked about tonight at the end of that document. And then as we bring forward, we're going to come back to council with a policy first that's uh, uh, a little more refined than this one is, and then each one of those action items, there'll be another ordinance or, uh, or resolution uh, once council adopts the entire policy that will bring more details forward in that. About oh, Ohana, will, I think, will be up in front of council to adopt you know, fairly shor shortly within the next couple of months. So if, if you look at the details that are in the 20-page plan, which, believe me, is, is pretty packed. Um, so when do you expect uh, Several things in the plan are, are already underway. So the, the uh, rewriting the codes and zoning for the transit oriented development, we're about 95% done with that. We have a meeting at, uh, if you're in the Waipahu area, at Waipahu Intermediate School on November 13th. Uh, yeah. So I was nodding. I got that one right. Waipahu Intermediate at, at November 13th, where we're unveiling the draft codes. Um, we've also will be bringing to council uh, more details on the financial strategy in the next couple of months. And I, I think the third thing is Ohana will will be next up. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is David Nash. I'm a real estate broker here. And I wanted to see, because there's so many units in Kailua, uh, even Kahala, St. Louis Heights, Palolo that have two kitchens, is there anything in place to legitimize those? Because a lot of those people are wanting to do that. And then I've got a, a couple of follow-ups beyond that. But. Um, the answer is yes. Um, in uh, our proposal, we anticipate having an amnesty period uh, so that folks can come in. Uh, we will review to make sure they are meeting code. Uh, we'll give them the opportunity, if they're not, to bring their units to code. Um, so, yes, we, we will be uh, uh, offering that. Uh, Besides the yes. Um, one more question about um, uh, ADUs is, is that I'm I've been saving for a single family home and I feel like they're going to add a great deal of value to being able to add an ADU. So I'd like to live on St. Louis Heights, you know, target price is about 850000 As soon as you add an ADU, that's going to become a $1.1 $1 million home. And I know that's, that's going to push it up. So it's a concern for me because I'd like to get a single family home. It's going to be great for my clients who already own homes. So. Thank you. Any other questions from the, the audience? Otherwise, I can go to the, oh, please, please. Yeah. This is, a, uh, I'm Bob Mikata. This is more of a comment than a question, but 10, 15 years ago, I was working a lot on homelessness, and I, concluded that the problem would never be solved until more affordable units came online. And it felt at that time, and maybe we're back at this, the policy of government towards the homeless was, please go away and die. And we may be at that point again. And that's why the political will the creativity is coming forth now to address it because we're putting people in jail. I mean, I was surprised to, and I'm not really surprised that Ted Sakai said that a third of the inmates at 
OCCC are actually homeless people. So it, when we talk about criminalizing homelessness, it has already happened. And the sit lie bills, you know, maybe they're necessary, but it is moving in the direction of criminalizing. So what's happening now with your proposal, Mayor, is that it gives hope and it may have taken the crisis that we're in now to move these things forward. And we cannot let this crisis go without addressing the need for affordable housing. And it's not perfect. You admit that it's not perfect. It needs a considerable amount of work. But I'm very happy to see people coming out and putting the energy into making it happen. And really, we can't let the crisis pass without addressing the need. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Brett Keller. Thank you. We want to thank the mayor and his team for the excellent ideas which came forward. I just want to ask a question. In Wahiwa or in Waipau, there are houses that deserve to have a red card. Okay, what is the plan with that houses? Or like with the health department right now, gives it to restaurants? They're not livable. There are apartment units. Uh, I mean, they should be torn down. What is the plan with all of this? Because this is just makes Hawaii look pretty bad. Okay, I'm, I'm not real sure how to answer this particular question because essentially, if these are uh, um, units that do not meet uh, code, do not uh, comply with the housing code, if they're not habitable, if they're not livable, then there are two things that need to be done. Okay. Um, I'm, okay. If if they met code back in the 50s, uh, then they and they're uh, compliant under our housing code, then that's fine. You know, basically, we don't uh, essentially create nonconformities and illegal homes because the cur the uh, building codes change or the zoning codes change. Basically, um, you can keep your home, as long as it's well maintained under the housing code, you can keep it. Um, and um, whether it fits the c present community standards or not, well, I have a house that was built in 1969. It has uh, aluminum wiring in it, which doesn't meet code right now. Does that mean that I have to basically uh, knock down my house or basically change my wiring? No, as long as I keep it uh, functionally uh, working because it met code back in the 60s, uh, it's fine. They have to meet housing code. We have inspectors. That's what DPP does, the Department of Planning Permitting. If there's a problem with substandard housing, uh, we go out and we investigate. But if it meets uh, housing code standards, if it's well maintained and it meets the codes that were in place at that time, then it's fine. Anybody else from the audience have a question or comment? I'd like to come up. <clears throat> if not, I'd like to start off to uh, reading the, the cards that came up here. You have something? Um, the first question is, uh, why is housing being sold if we need it? And I'm assuming we're talking about the, the Hopi, the Hopi uh, properties that we have. And I'd like to ask uh, Managing Director Amber Shin come up to answer the question. And I went to the um, ULI, the uh, Urban Land Institute conference in New York. It was fabulous. Learned a lot. Bring home to share with everybody uh, in Honolulu. Okay, the city and county of Honolulu has 12 properties. Uh, we call it the Hopi portfolio. They are all affordable, low income, very low income, and mixed income properties. And we, uh, the city council made a decision in 2008 to, to put them on the market for a long-term lease, 65 years, and that sale was percolating along until it died uh, in January of this year. 
So the portfolio is still under city hands and we are still looking at it. We're revisiting it again to decide what's the best thing to do. Even if we sell any one of it or any part of it, please be assured that it will still remain affordable housing. Even had it the sale gone forward in January, it would have retained the affordability mix. It would have, in fact, the policy in 2008 um, indicated that the, the portfolio should go with a dominant uh, a mix of 60% AMI. So just because we're selling it doesn't mean it's going to go out of affordability. It will still remain affordable at the various levels of the properties. So it will be a z um, no loss of inventory of affordable rentals. Thank you, Amber. What can I say? This, well, it's 65 years lease, it'll come back to us. At the end of 65 years, it comes back to the city. It doesn't, they don't own it after 65 years. It's a 65 year lease, and then it comes back to the city. Thank you, Amber. Um, next question was, uh, would proposed ADUs apply island-wide? Would ADUs apply to R5? What do you, when do you anticipate rollout? Essentially, any uh, area that is currently uh, uh, Ohana zoned um, will be uh, allowed to uh, be Are ADUs. Is it the blue? Is it all these different colors? No. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's all of these different non-green colors where ADUs can go. So as you can see, there are white tile, all the three urban home blue, white eye. covenants and restrictions would not allow it, but it's all in the older neighborhoods around the island that they'd be allowed. That's how you get the 22,000. Okay. That's correct. And in question, uh, when are we expected to roll this out? I'm hoping that we can have something uh, to the city council um, by uh, the beginning of uh, next year. Thank you, Art. <clears throat> next question that was submitted. Rentals are going to increase with this plan. But what about minimum rental standards? Some folks rent their units that are not livable at ridiculous prices. The rental market is out of control and is in need of quality controls and certification. <laughs> you might as well stay up here, man. The city and county does not have rent control, so um, that's that's off the table right there. If if, if we're worried about again uh, substandard conditions, uh, we have a housing code. Uh, we have inspectors that uh, make sure that uh, all housing, whether it's rental or uh, non-rental, are uh, meeting uh, minimum housing code standards. So um, basically, that's it. Thank you, Art. <clears throat> Next question. The affordable housing crisis is an island-wide issue. Affordable housing requirements for new construction place the burden for paying for new product on buyers, not developers. Is this fair? Shouldn't the entire community pay for this? Uh, it's, it's a good question. There's several pieces in the strategy. So some of those pieces are talking about a uh, significant amount more of public investment. Some of your tax money, as Mayor said, for infrastructure to incentivize TOD, uh, use of city lands, use of state lands. Uh, uh, but there is a portion of the strategy that does talk about requiring a percentage of affordable housing uh, be built by every major development. Uh, so so it, it, that, is, that does, in some cases, you know, pa pass on some of the costs to, to buyers as a portion of, of their effort. Uh, when we built the, the whole package and tried to come up with something that would actually address that 24,000 need, it really takes every one of those pieces to, to deliver what's needed. Okay. 
Next question is, will there be any preferences for current residents for sale housing? So when the new units are built, are there going to be any preferences for residents? Um, and not that I know of. That's a, that's a tough one to, you know, to address. It, it's very, if you're talking about preferences for state of Hawaii residents, that's, uh, uh, that's a really hard one to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question is, how is the city going to help DHHL move the ADU process forward? <clears throat> <laughs> you know, I think um, for this question right now, um, DHHL has its, has its uh, priorities and has its own uh, mission. Uh, for us, we're pushing a strategy that we're hoping the whole island can jump behind, not just but the city and county, not just the developers, but the state agencies as well. As Mayor Caldwell had said, if the state keeps pushing forward as they are, um, we're looking at another 4,000 that will double the, the amount of units that we're looking at. So we're working with everybody to try and get this through. Next question. Sometime during the Reagan administration, the federal government stopped building low-income housing. What part can the federal government play in incentivizing the increase in low-income housing? Not to manage them, but to finance construction. Uh, one of the, in the, in the details in the, in the plan you can look at online, one of the proposals that we're uh, making to council is that we consider uh, adjusting how we currently use our federal dollars. Home, home program and CDB, Community Development Block Grant. Um, we get a certain amount of money each year for that. And um, one of the things that we've discovered is if you take the, the home money, instead of kind of doling it out to, to groups for operating dollars, if you take that and use it for projects, you can actually use something called Section 108 and multiply that money by five. So we're looking at creative programs like that that would actually uh, multiply some of our federal dollars. If you're interested in the geeky parts, there's probably half a dozen people who really will follow up on this here. Uh, there's what something called the HUD Consolidated Plan that we're required to do every five years. Uh, we're doing that right now, and within that plan is some ideas for uh, better leveraging our federal dollars. So you can comment on that plan as well with those kind of ideas. Thank you. Well, one of the things that could be, hi, my, my name is uh, Kali Watson. Uh, I used to be the director of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, in building uh, housing for Native Hawaiians, it was always a challenge in trying to access the various funds. So uh, there was this one project we just got completed in uh, Nanakuli involving, uh, you know, about eight different funding sources. A lot of it, uh, you know, is really um, the different funding sources working together. Just uh, the federal fund is not going to do it, especially where you have gap financing that you have to fill. And so I'm glad to see where the city is now, uh, setting aside monies to fill that gap. But you also have the Rental Housing Trust Fund that also can be used, which comes from the state, HHFTC. You have the tax credits, the low-income housing tax credits, that can also be used. Um, bonding is very, the Hulu May bonding, that's an area that, um, you know, there's a lot of capacity in there that has not been used. So, uh, you know, with respect to all these different funding sources, if the uh, various, like you say, the state as well as the city with the home funds and some of the other funding sources are going to be collectively put together, then I think we can, uh, you know, do a lot uh, more projects. On the, uh, with respect to the ADUs, I think that, um, you know, it's really, a, again, a matter of the state get it, get, getting off their okoles and kind of passing the regulations uh, that can facilitate, especially in the Hawaiian homelands areas. You know, there's over 10,000 homesteads that uh, have existing units. 
And when you look at the homeless situation, a lot of the homeless are in these Native Hawaiian communities. So for not only uh, giving them uh, uh, the ability to put up these ADUs, but also, you know, if the city could step up and maybe uh, reauthorize their CDBG funds to assist in the funding of these ADUs uh, with low-cost grant monies, or depending on the income of the homeowner, maybe even treat them as grants. I think that would be uh, something that uh, could help facilitate these ADUs. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. Please. please. No, no, please, come on. Oh, yeah, sure. You raise your hand. I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Mayor. Uh, my name is Carlos Vasquez. Um, I'm from original Dominican Republic. And like everybody, you know, uh, coming to United States with American dream. Praise the hand who want the American dream, who have the American dream, right? Everybody want it, right? So, you know, we come in with that mentality, and we get an American dream. But, you know, in the situation, uh, what I see is uh, when I live in on the middle lane, right, uh, I have the opportunity to be uh, uh, in best uh, people, uh, buy, buy houses, uh, not too many, but I started and sell it, fix it and sell it river houses. And also, I am a pastor, evangelical pastor. I know a lot of people here, you no know, sympathies with Christian people. It's a lot of things change in the world, right? But that's not me. We can be Ohana people in Hawaii. You, my view is I can't, uh, like, uh, with the American Dream, and communication also. I was one of the founders first in the Northeast for the first radio station over there. But, you know, they put everything beautiful over here. But when they, everything materialized, if you see back all the application, the grant they have, who had that uh, granting uh, license? Who have that granting houses? You know, uh, that's, that's my point on the table. Because when I come in here, I was a homely. I was on the street. I can speak, you know, with my family, you know, from that level to be a homely. You know, to sleep in the car, to take care of the cucaracha from my hand, and living a lot of things. But I'm proud of who I am, and I want to raise my family, like everybody here. We got opportunity to present Hawaii around the world. We a lot of things be uh, available over here in Hawaii. So what I have on the table is, you know, uh, how is the opportunity for uh, low-income people who want to study again what they already taken from us? Thank you very much for coming up. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, please. Uh, as kind of a follow-up to the federal side, is there any representative from the military here? Because that, that's a major source of our housing and also it really supports our rental rates. Um, a lot of people are aware that there's a base area housing allowance for the military here. And if I can rent a unit out for $2,000 to an E5 or somebody like that, versus someone who's lower income that might only pay 1600, I'm gonna rent it all day for 1900 to that young military person. They generally are less problems. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of incentive there to use the military and you can see near to a lot of these bases. Is there an ongoing conversation with them to build more on-base housing to support their own staff that they bring here instead of them pushing them into the community? Thank you. We are having talks with the military, especially in the TOD areas as well, because we want, do want to encourage them to build more in the TOD areas as well. So that, that is ongoing conversation, yeah. Thank you. 
The next question was, will multifamily buildings provide land for tenants to work on gardens for their families? Will these rental units allow tenants to have pets? <laughs> I think I can assure you that the government is not going to make rules about whether or not people can have pets. Uh, that's really up to each, each building and, and, and landlord. Uh, but we are, if you've looked at any of the TOD plans, we, we are encouraging and requiring uh, open space, smaller scale open space, whether it's for people to gather, sit with their neighbors. I love the one who talked about the cul-de-sac as the, the community gathering space. Uh, in TOD areas, we are gonna require places for, for gathering, but um, we, would, we would certainly encourage uh, anybody who wants to have gardens uh, and you know urban agriculture in the area. I think Ho'opili out on the Abbott Plain is incorporating uh, urban agriculture in their, in their formal plan. Thank you, Harrison. Yeah, you know, as mayor, I, I am passionate about providing more uh, opportunities for urban farming. You know, think uh, urban lifestyle, you don't think of having farming, but you can see in some of the great cities around the world, they actually have farming in the city. And you can walk a couple blocks to a block where there's a farm where you can get fresh honey you know, smell basil, get some fresh tomatoes that are growing right there. And it, it's a really neat idea, and I think we could do that inside our city. As mentioned, Whole Pili is going to have 200 acres of that type of farming where you can walk from your house across the street to a great little farm. We can do more of that, and we do in a way. Manoa, where I live, we have some farming. Hawaii you got some farming in the back, Nii Nursery. Could we do that more often in other subdivisions? Encourage that art to have ha that happen increases, makes our lifestyle better. And while I don't think government should mandate where pets are allowed or not, I would allow pets in every building. So anyway, that's my personal preference. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> I saw you walking up, did you have, oh, thank you. Yeah, the next question was, there's some fairly large parcels available out there, but there's a limited sewer capacity which restricts the number of units that can be built on that parcel, even though the zoning allows it. <coughs> Is there anything that's being done to increase capacity? Um, I, I think many people are aware that uh, we're actually in the middle of a, a consent decree with EPA that is requiring about $5 billion, almost more than we're spending on rail over the next several years in sewer improvements. So there's a lot of improvements being done. Most of those uh, in the pipes are not to increase capacity. In the plants, there will be. Um, our sewer folks at the Department of Environment um, are looking at all of the TOD areas and looking uh, once we know when developments are, are planned, we're looking at all those areas and seeing what is needed uh, to increase capacity and when it can be programmed. Uh, there's some places where it's easier than others and we're focusing on the hot areas, but it is it will be a challenge to fund all those improvements. Thank you, Harrison. Yeah, the next question was, would it be possible to rezone to allow more housing units on ag land for farm workers? Uh, can modular prefab units be allowed to construct micro unit development? Yes, it can. Uh, however, I do want to preference the, or preface that uh, uh, agriculture uh, lands are primarily for agriculture. Um, when um, you build a um, dwelling in agricultural lands, it is an accessory to the ag use. So as long as we can um, maintain viable agricultural development uh, on those parcels, then the answer is yes, we can do that. Thank you, Art. Hey, next question. Generally, what amendments will be needed to both county ordinances and state statutes to accomplish the island-wide housing strategic plan? When will these proposals be submitted to the city council and state legislature? Uh, there's somewhere between uh, eight to 10 different uh, amendments or resolutions, or in some cases, new ordinances that would be required. We talked about a couple of coming up in the next couple of months, we'll be introducing the new codes and zoning. Um, in, uh, we'll, we'll also be introducing and amend, actually, Council Member Menor has already introduced uh, a, a, a resolution uh, to, with a draft ordinance for the ADU, and we're 
looking at that and, and, and doing technical analysis on it. So that'll be coming back in a couple of months. There's a few other ordinances that we need to look at. If council adopts the overall policy, the next thing will be coming back with the actual proposed new affordable housing requirements. So that will require an ordinance. Uh, if council adopts that, then we'll also then come back with an amendment to the existing unilateral agreement or UA that covers rezonings right now. And so we would propose to align the, the UA that covers rezoning to be the same as the new policy. There's a few other smaller ones, the new parking regulations and things like that as part of codes and zoning. Thank you, Harrison. Here, one more question for you. Oh, sorry. Harrison gave you the technical answer. Let me give you the bigger answer. And the bigger answer is that we are going to be aggressively looking at all ordinances, LUOs, to l reduce the difficulty of building affordable housing. And that is our primary goal, is to, is to streamline the process, ease the a, a burden on developers to build affordable housing. Because the city is not gonna be able to build all the affordable housing we need. And we have to have private developers, whether it's a single family owner who wants to build an ADU or a major property developer who wants to build a big subdivision or a big rental um, uh, uh, complex. And so our goal as a city is to ease the regulatory process so that development can happen. Thank you, Amber. Okay, next question. Is the off-site requirement going to be on a sliding scale, i.e. more density for lower AMI? Good question. The quick answer is yes. We, we propose the, the simple version here, but if you're familiar with a lot of developments, uh, the, the, there's fine points within. So if you're building three bedrooms versus studios, there'll be different percentages. If you're pushing it down to 60% without government subsidy, we would negotiate with you on the percentages. So I think that there will be, the intent is to be flexible enough to get the most affordable, most affordable longest term that we can get. Thank you, Harrison. <clears throat> the next question, are you considering decommission of, uh, decommissioning Barbers Point Naval Air Station for affordable housing? Thanks, Amber. <laughs> no. <laughs> I like her answer. She gave the short answer. As you know, Barbara's point is uh, the, the, it's been decommissioned, and they're trying to turn it over to the state of Hawaii, the city and county of Honolulu, and then private developers. And um, we have not taken title to our portion. We get a beautiful beach, three times the size of Ala Moana Beach Park. But the minute we touch it, we're responsible for all infrastructure. That's rebuilding the sewer system, the water system that hasn't been dealt with by the military because they were looking to get rid of, decommission it for many, many years. It's over a billion dollars of infrastructure improvements. So to get to Amber's point, partly before you see, I think, anyone touching that property, they're going to see some government entity, and I believe it should be the federal government, bringing that sewer system and water system up to standard. And yes, then you could see housing. There's, someone asked about military housing. There are barracks out there that are not being used. There are others, US vets. A lot of homeless providers are out there doing great jobs in former bachelor quarters. But there's so much more potential out there. But this is where we need to partner up with the federal government too. See if they're willing to step up and help us. Then I think you'll see more action happening out there. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just notified that we're, we're, it's, it's getting short on time now, right? Yeah. Yep, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, I've got a couple more questions on this. Like I said, if you guys have any comment, questions or comments, please feel free to come up. <clears throat> Next question is, why can't we provide housing, very basic, for homeless or nearly homeless families as live-on-site caretakers, security watch custodians at all kinds of public facilities, parks, restrooms, bus stops, schools, etc.? So, um, Many of these go over across a lot of different jurisdictions, but we're looking at how can the city, state, federal government work together uh, in really addressing homelessness in a comprehensive manner. So what we've been doing uh, with, with our island is, an, 
uh, initiative that we're, we're calling Hale O Malama. So we're looking at how can we take down all the barriers to housing homeless individuals as fast as possible. For the city and the state, uh, our, the city we have our Housing First program, the state uh, has their Housing First program as well. We're, we're partnering up with the city, the, the state, federal government, and all the service providers, which a few of you are in here right now. And we are making sure that we can actually know what the need is for those who are on the street and connect the, them to that appropriate housing and program resources available to them as fast as possible. Um, I like the ideas, we'll explore more, but uh, at this point, until then, um, we're trying to do as things as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you, June. <clears throat> is, is there any other questions or comments that, that the, the audience may have? Um, if so, we'd lo I'd love to have them, because um, otherwise we'd like to close, um, and Mary's gonna come up and close, but um, Art and Harrison and June and the other smart people in the administration is going to stick around. If you have any questions, you want to come up and talk to somebody, please do. And also, please know that there's another five boxes of pizza out there, and I don't think anybody wants to take it home. So please feel free to have some. With that, Mayor, please. You know, I want to thank everyone for, for coming tonight. You know, this is our first attempt to reach out to the broader community. We have been going to the neighborhood boards and making presentations, and Ed Sniffen has been to any number at this point. We're going to keep reaching out. We don't want to say, okay, aloha, see you later, wait until you see it get, get, get enacted. Um, we want you to continue to work with us. We'll stick around after you can come up and talk to us, but you can also reach us in any of the ways showing up here on this board. We want your input, and as we go to the council, this is a partnership. Um, part of it is with the council. You, we want you to work with them when the, these bills appear. Come down and testify. Help make them better. Um, they're going to change as we move along. That's one thing. Developers, we want to hear from you. We want to know what are we missing? What, are we go what can we do to get, to incentivize you working? I just saw David Arakal back there. David, you haven't said anything tonight. Man, I just saw you. You've been here the whole time. You haven't been wearing your palaka either. Come up here and say something. Vote for God. No, come up here. You don't want to say a few words. Anyway, this guy is been passionate about affordable housing just forever. I don't know how he keeps his hair from going white, but uh, I wanted to, so I'm asking, and David is an example of that with the developer group, help us. And if we're not doing it right or we're getting it wrong, I don't wanna do something that's gonna go on a shelf and nothing's changed. And I wanna put a lot of effort getting everyone all stirred up and the whole thing dies. And I wanna do what Maui did, which is the government there, the county government, mandated affordable housing and nothing was built. That doesn't accomplish anything. So we need your help. So it's not goodbye tonight, after tonight. You know, step up, help us in other ways, keep weighing in. This is not, it's gonna be ongoing. We're gonna put the first bills in, Ohana zoning, accessory unit, that's gonna, accessory dwelling units, is gonna be controversial. There's gonna be a lot of discussion. So help us in that discussion and everything else in between. I just want to thank you guys for coming. Travel safe. It's been a tough week for all of us. But hey, we live in the best place in the entire world. And we're going to make it better with you. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Mahalo.